Thank you very much for that great uh, introduction, Sandeep. Um, I should mention that Sandeep is one of the students who worked very effectively with me on mathematizing various parts of the simulation field and has been continuously active doing research since the time of his PhD. Uh, I should also just say, just to correct the record, that Peter Taylor is now thankfully the editor-in-chief of the Applied Probability Journals. <laughs> I handed off at the beginning of this year. Um, okay, so uh, I have three lectures that I'm going to present to you today, Thursday, and Friday. And this is not going to be three lectures going more deeply day by day into a single topic. Rather, what I'm going to do is discuss three different topic areas that I think are representative of different uh, intellectual thrust areas within the applied probability domain to give you some sense, some taste of the range of different problems that exist within the discipline of applied probability. Now, I should say from the outset that uh, uh, the perspective that I have on applied probability is very strongly shaped by the fact that I sit within an operations research group, and that really is my disciplinary background. So when I think about applied probability, I think about it from the perspective of the types of problems that people in operations research and management science are interested in solving. And uh, I think it might be useful, particularly for the students here, just to say a little bit about my perspectives on the way that I think the applied probability discipline has changed within the OR field since I joined in the 1980s. So just to give you some sense of the changes that have occurred in that span of time, when I joined the field and went to conferences, it was typically the case that people described simulation as being the method, quote unquote, of last resort. So that was usually said in a pejorative kind of way. Uh, the really good people don't do anything in the simulation field. They solve problems analytically in closed form. It's the losers who do simulation. <laughs> Maybe that's a little bit strong, but that was basically the sentiment, I think, when I joined the field. So uh, there have been several big things that I think have happened over the last 25, 30 years that uh, have made a big uh, impact in the field. Thankfully, uh, I think most of the people that work within the operations research space and do applied probability recognize that we actually live in a world in which computers are available and we ought to leverage off the power of computing. And that uh, is aligned very well with what you would see in the other main theoretical thrust area within operations research, which would be traditionally the optimization area. Optimization has always been very heavily computational right from its outset. So I think that because applied probability is becoming more computational, is now more alignment with things that people in the optimization space are doing. And you also see that in the types of framings, problem framings, that people are interested in solving these days, many of which come up in the area of decision making, in particular decision making under uncertainty. So you saw one particular take on that from uh, Jose Blanchet over the last several days, which he gave a beautiful set of lectures on optimal transport and related ideas. And that is clearly a disciplinary area that's sitting at the intersection between optimization and computing. But uh, there are many other points of tangency between the two fields that are developing at this point. And uh, you could uh, also take the view that uh, with the rising popularity of machine learning, there are now more and more opportunities at that intersection to also do things that uh, rely on both a profound understanding of optimization tools and a deep understanding of stochastics. So I think a lot of the uh, intellectual thrust of the field is moving in that direction. Uh, I should just also just say that uh, when I started in the field, um, there was very little interest, despite the fact that people doing applied probability within the OR domain would be well-trained in probability. 
uh, I think it's fair to say that very few people had any interest in looking at problems at the intersection between data sciences and probability, and in particular, uh, statistical inference for stochastic processes, and uh, the problems that they were interested in pushing forward on. So there's almost no literature that I think came out of the OR community looking at inference problems for the types of models that OR people were doing, which of course is uh, transmitting to us the idea that fitting these models to data wasn't important for many of the researchers that were doing work in the applied probability space. So that has also changed in the last five or 10 years. There's now intense interest in building models based on data, in part because of the uh, developments within the machine learning space, and uh, in part because I think people are just recognizing that uh, the field needs to up its game in terms of building better models predictively and prescriptively. So I'll say a little bit more about that in tomorrow's talk. Now I noticed that the 55 minute clock has not actually started. So I assume <laughs> <laughs> all of the time that I've just used is extra time given to me as a freebie. All right, so I've given you some uh, sense of the way I think the field has changed in the last uh, 30 years. I said at the outset that I was going to try to talk about three different problem areas. Today I'm going to talk about a problem that arises in the context of what's called output analysis. So output analysis within the simulation field is basically that part of the field that focuses on trying to understand how much error or uncertainty uh, is present in a Monte Carlo calculation when you bring the calculation to termination. So all Monte Carlo algorithms all are based on sampling. All sampling-based algorithms will have random error associated with it. And for reasons that I'll discuss in a moment, uh, it's especially important within the Monte Carlo context to provide error assessments. That general set of theory problems associated with doing that type of error assessment well and accurately is called output analysis. So what I'm going to be talking about today is basically a special problem within that output analysis field. And by the way, it's joint work with Jing Dong, who's an assistant professor at Columbia University and uh, an academic grandchild of mine. Jose is a former student of mine, I'm fortunate to say, and uh, Jing was one of his PhD students that I got a chance to work with, so this represents her work as well. So let me just give you a bit of a sense of what I'll talk about over the next three days. Today I'm going to talk about output analysis, a particular problem in that context. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about a set of problems that I think is really quite important and fundamental with at least operations research applications of stochastic modeling, namely to deal with non-stationarity effects. So if you look at almost every real world context in which uh, operations research stochastic modeling is applied, you'll see that there are very strong time of day effects, day of week effects, and so forth that are present. Oftentimes those are really the first order effects. They actually even dominate stochastic effects oftentimes. So to ignore that, that's really not something that you can do if you want to think about using these models, not as stylized models, but models that are actually going to be used to make numerical predictions. And then on Friday, I'll talk about uh, an application to a stochastic modeling and applied probability to the internet uh, commerce uh, area. And that'll give me an opportunity from a theory standpoint to tell you about a mathematical tool that I think is fundamental to the analysis of Markov chains and Markov processes, namely something called Poisson's equation. So that's an important topic in its own way, and I'll show how you can apply that in a very clean way to an interesting recent problem that I've worked on in the area of uh, temporal interference coming out of A-B experimentation within the world of internet commerce. All right, so today, uh, again, because I know that there are a number of PhD students here, a number of graduate students here, uh, I want to give some sense of uh, the output analysis, or I'm going to talk a bit about error assessment for Monte Carlo, then we'll talk about sequential stopping, and then I'll talk about uh, the new sequential stopping rule that Jing and I have uh, proposed. <clears throat> 
All right, so what's the Monte Carlo method? Probably everybody here is familiar with it at some level. Uh, this is the problem and the method of wanting to compute an expectation or a probability. Of course, all probabilities can be represented as expectations of indicator random variables. Uh, virtually every calculation that we would want to do within the world of stochastic modeling involves some kind of expectation. And the general principle of uh, Monte Carlo is that we're going to uh, numerically compute these expectations and probabilities via sampling. And of course, the Monte Carlo method in its most uh, simple setting is we want to compute the mean of some random variable. We generate n IID copies of that random variable. So we do n computer experiments replicating the random variable x. And then to uh, compute an estimate of the mean, we just average the x's. And of course, we have this very nice uh, law of large numbers that tells us that this algorithm is consistent. It does indeed converge as uh, the sample size n goes to infinity. And then, of course, we have a second order result present through the central limit theorem. And the central limit theorem is asserting that uh, when you scale up the difference between the estimator and the quantity we're trying to compute by square root of the sample size, that converges to a normal random variable. That's the standard central limit theorem. And I think it's convenient to rewrite it in this sort of approximation form. Uh, so this is a non-rigorous statement. The rigorous version of this, of course, is the limit theorem up here. But this is basically asserting uh, how we should interpret this result. It's saying that the estimator is the quantity that we want to compute plus an error term. And the error term for large values of n looks asymptotically normal. Uh, and an important key point here is that the error goes down with the sample size, with the number of computer experiments n done by 1 over the square root of the number of experiments n. Of course, that's telling us that uh, <clears throat> this algorithm, while it's very general, it's very general because for any uh, integrable random variable, of course, the law of large numbers requires integrability of the random variable x. That's about the weakest regularity condition that you could imagine putting on the integrand x in order to expect that you have a well-defined problem that, for which an expectation can actually be computed. <clears throat> so. Uh, in the presence of that uh, very modest level of regularity, if we improve, if we assume just a little bit more finite variance, then we get this uh, approximation, which tells us that the uh, error as a function of n goes to zero slowly. And just to give you a, just to fix ideas for everybody, uh, if you want to use Monte Carlo to add one significant figure of accuracy, that, of course, basically corresponds to increasing the accuracy by a factor of 10 to get one additional significant figure. This result, of course, is telling us that we need to increase the sample size by a factor of 100. This is an algorithm that, while it's extremely general, we basically didn't have to assume any real regularity on x. There's a price for it, namely to get lots of significant figures is basically hopeless using this class of methods. So there's a class of methods that works quite effectively if you're willing to live with two or three significant figures, but it's never a method that you would imagine using for, let's say, seven or eight significant figures of accuracy. Now, fortunately, in the problems that uh, come up within my discipline, we're not dealing with systems that are governed typically by physical laws. We're working with systems that are governed by man-made dynamics. And in that context, there are no universal laws that govern the behavior of these systems. Uh, and as a consequence, when we write down the mathematical uh, laws of motion for the system, there inevitably will be significant model error. And it's probably fair to say that in almost every operations research application that you can imagine, the model error is probably up at the order of at least 5%, let's say. Right, so going for 10 significant figures in a setting where you have a 5% model error probably doesn't make much sense. So Monte Carlo is well suited for problems with that type of model fidelity. But nevertheless, uh, we do want to get those three significant figures. In some problems, it's quite hard to do that because the variance parameter sigma might be quite hard for that particular problem instance. So uh, we don't know for any problem instance how large we need to make n. Uh, 
So because it's slowly converging, doing error assessment is important. Error assessment, roughly speaking, for an algorithm that involves drawing random numbers is at the end of the algorithm, you're going to have some kind of answer, and you want to attach a plus or minus to that answer. How much error is there in the solution? And that error is typically going to be assessed, that plus or minus is typically going to be assessed through a confidence interval statement. And to get the confidence interval statement, we're going to use the this central limit theorem, this normal approximation. We're going to use the fact that the error is asymptotically normally distributed. So here's a fixed sample size procedure that is sort of the common bread and butter within the Monte Carlo field. The computational scientist, the stochastic modeler, chooses some sample size n that the modeler hopes is large enough. You run n experiments. You compute the sample variance. Sample variance clearly converges to sigma squared under finite variance assumptions as n goes to infinity by the law of large numbers. We use the normal distribution to uh, attach z values. Uh, in particular, we find an interval minus z to plus z that contains a normal 0, 1 with probability, let's say, 90%. And then if we use this interval, this is just an interval that's basically induced by the central limit theorem on the previous slide. This confidence interval will have an approximate coverage of the true parameter, uh, the mean of x with approximate coverage 90%. So that's how you get error assessments in the world of Monte Carlo. All right, so these are all asymptotic confidence intervals. Central limit theorem is guaranteeing that as n goes to infinity, the coverage of that confidence interval, the likelihood that the parameter falls into that interval goes to, let's say, 90% as the sample size n goes to infinity. Now there are a few things that I'd just like to say uh, because I think they're important. Um, for every fixed value of n, the coverage in this confidence interval can be essentially arbitrarily bad. In other words, the normal approximation can be essentially arbitrarily bad in a typical problem instance. When you, because in a typical Monte Carlo problem, it may be very difficult or even impossible to estimate bounds on the variance. And so as a consequence, since you can't know a priori what the variance is, uh, that means you have to rely on the sample variance. And the sample variance, despite the fact that it converges as n goes to infinity to sigma squared, can be quite misleading for small values of sample size. So for example, in a discrete population, it's possible that the first five samples are just repeated values of one particular point in the sample space. So in that case, you'd get a sample variance of zero, even though the actual population variance is positive. So, in particular, uh, that suggests the possibility of early stopping in Monte Carlo algorithms that one tries to implement sequentially. Right? It could be that the early estimates of the sample variance are quite misleading and underrepresenting the true variability in the population. That type of problem comes up in a kind of standard way, also in the context of heavy tails. You have heavy tails, you may not have seen any outcomes yet in the tail of the distribution, and those are the outcomes that are going to produce high variance estimates that are consistent with the actual population variance. All right, so um, since we don't typically have any a priori estimate on the variance, uh, these are not, this is not an algorithm where we have any uniform guarantee of coverage. All we know is for a particular problem instance, we get correct coverage as the sample size n goes to infinity. So this is uh, an example of an algorithm that's widely used. Every statistician would be totally comfortable with using it. Virtually every person in the Monte Carlo field would be totally comfortable with using it. This is an example of an algorithm that some people, in particular there are lots of people within the CS world, would be uncomfortable with this type of algorithm because there's no uniform guarantee that's present. So I think it's an important distinction to make in terms of thinking philosophically about how you build algorithms, about whether you build an algorithm that works uniformly across a large class of problem instances, and then you build the algorithm to basically satisfy worst case bounds, or whether you build algorithms that are instance by instance consistent in the sense that this confidence interval result is. So 
This is, a, again, a situation where if you took a uniform bound view, this would be a completely unusable algorithm. This would be precluded from even consideration in that world. And yet probably most people that do computational math, most statisticians would view this being a totally useful result in building statistical methods and Monte Carlo algorithms. So looking at uh, consistency of algorithms instance by instance leads you to algorithmic design that looks quite different from building algorithms that are sort of working uniformly across all problem instances. Okay. <clears throat> So one of the problems with that algorithm is that when you choose sample size n to begin with, you may have misestimated how large n has to be because you had no a priori clue of what the variance is for this particular problem. And it may be that you end up with an embarrassing lar embarrassingly large half width. So the confidence interval may be three plus or minus eight. Right? That's not a particularly useful confidence statement. Now, Clearly, what you'd have preferred is to do what most people within numerical mathematics like to do, which is to run algorithms for as long as it takes to get convergence to a reasonable error tolerance. The error tolerance in this context being measured by the how big that plus or minus is. Have you resolved the plus or minus down to, let's say, 5% of the point estimate? So now we're talking about trying to get the half width of this confidence interval down to an accuracy epsilon. So there's an easy fix to this. The easy fix is something called a two-stage procedure. A two-stage procedure follows the obvious path. It has two stages, after all. Stage one is just generate some trial runs, let's say 50 trial runs. Estimate the sample variance from the 50 trial runs, and then use this obvious formula for the sample size n that you'll use in the second stage. So plug in the sample variance estimate from the first stage into this formula, and then run n production runs in order to estimate the quantity of interest. So this is a simple algorithm to implement, but it has some problems with it. First of all, to really make this algorithm work and give you the required error tolerance epsilon, we need to let the number of observations in the first stage get large. And the reason, of course, that we need to do that is we need a consistent estimate of the variance in order to be able to get an accurate assessment of what uh, n needs to be. So uh, that typically creates a lot of wastage of uh, computational power in that first run. And secondly, even if you have a reasonably good estimate in the first run, you may still over under uh, uh, produce in terms of the final half width of the confidence interval obtained at the end of the second stage. So it could be a little bit larger than epsilon, a little bit smaller than epsilon in terms of half width. So this is an algorithm that, while it's an obvious uh, fix to this problem of not knowing the variance a priori, this is not the standard way that people that do Monte Carlo like to run their algorithms. So what people really like to do is to use a fully sequential algorithm. And the fully sequential algorithm is just compute the interval that we got in the fixed sample size case and just keep on adding observations until that uh, confidence interval resolves down to a half width that has the required precision epsilon. So, this is an algorithm that was studied by Chow and Robbins in the 1960s. This is a standard sequential stopping algorithm. And uh, there's a nice limit theorem that you can prove in this context, namely as the precision epsilon goes to zero. Well, epsilon going to zero is effectively the same as forcing the sample size n to go to infinity. So it's implicitly going to uh, allow you to use the central limit theorem with larger and larger sample sizes as the epsilon goes to zero. And uh, as epsilon goes to zero, you do indeed get the correct coverage. That's what Xiao and Robbins proved in their 1960s paper. Now, the early termination problem that I referred to earlier, that's a serious problem. So you do have to do things to mitigate that. And one of the easier things to do is just to take the sample variance that you have. Remember, the sample variance in a discrete case could compute out to zero with positive probability. 
So one thing that you can do is just inflate that sample variance by some sequence a n going to zero slowly. And if you do that, then you choose the a n in a reasonable way. Then this algorithm uh, is an effective uh, algorithm that has this asymptotic coverage guarantee. Now, uh, one of the problems with this class of algorithms is that we have to estimate the variance. And the problem is that there are lots and lots of Monte Carlo problems in which estimating the variance is actually just a, either almost impossible to do or just a big pain to do from a computational standpoint. So I'll now describe some of the Monte Carlo problems that have that characteristic. There are lots of other ones beyond the ones that I'll mention. So here's one example. There are quite a few settings where we don't want to estimate the mean of a random variable x, but we want to estimate some deterministic smooth function g of an expected value. So for example, the variance is such a parameter, right? It is a smooth function of the mean of x and the second moment of x. And it's a nonlinear function of those quantities. Now there's an obvious estimator. Uh, we know how to estimate mean of x by just taking the sample average. The obvious estimator is just to take the g of the sample average. There's a relatively straightforward central limit theorem that you can derive in this context. And the uh, variance that you end up with is the variance of the random variable given by the gradient of g at the point value alpha inner product with the random vector x. So this is nice, except that there are problems where it's just painful to have to compute that uh, gradient. An example might be something like coefficient of correlation, sample coefficient of correlation. If you want to do that, that's a function of five different variables and it's a bit painful to compute the gradient. Maybe you'd like to just avoid all of that entirely. Um, so this is one example. Another very important example that arises in many settings, for example, the finance context, quantiles are known as value at risk uh, quantities. Value at risk being an important risk measure within the world of finance. Quantile is uh, defined as the root of this equation, the root of the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of x, giving you value p. And there's an obvious estimator, just take the empirical root, going with the empirical distribution function, and find the qn that makes the sample distribution function approximately p. And probably many of you know that there's, a, again, a central limit theorem for the sample quantile. And in this case, you get uh, the variance that shows up in, the center, in this uh, central limit theorem as being p times 1 minus p. Of course, this is known given the problem data that you start off with. We're told from the beginning that we want a 90% quantile. But unfortunately, sigma squared also includes the density of the random variable x evaluated at the quantile itself. So now you have two different problems. You don't actually know Q, but worse, you have to estimate the density. And estimating the density is a hard problem. Maybe you don't want to do that. Uh, so again, another setting in which uh, estimating the variance is painful. Uh, in the context of equilibrium computations, we typically want to compute uh, an equilibrium expectation, for example, for something like a Markov chain. And the way that that's usually done is by just running a long sample of the Markov chain out to time n, and then just averaging all of the f values that we've observed up to time n. And again, in this context, uh, there's a nice central limit theorem for, the, uh, for this estimator. But because of the fact that this estimator is averaging correlated random variables, the expression for the variance is unpleasant. In particular, it takes this form. It's the variance of f of x zero star x i star, by the way, is a stationary version of the Markov chain. A Markov chain started from equilibrium. And you see that you have an infinite sum of covariances you have to add in here. That's an unpleasant quantity to have to actually estimate consistently uh, within an algorithm. So by the way, the sigma squared is also related to the spectral density of the stationary version of this Markov chain. And so you can apply spectral density estimation methods. Spectral density estimates look a lot like density estimates, and they have the same flaws, the same unpleasant characteristics. But they typically converge at slower than square root convergence rate. Pardon me? Uh, 
The star here is uh, corresponding to the fact that we're not that we're looking at a stationary version of the underlying Markov chain, a Markov chain that's been started from equilibrium. So the sequence xi that we simulate typically is not started from equilibrium. We start that off in some state, like state three. But asymptotically, it becomes like a time stationary version of the Markov chain. And that's the xi star sequence down here. Correct. The density is much harder. Right, because the density is depending just on very local information around that point. There's almost no data around that point. So it's a very slowly converging quantity. Densities are much harder to estimate than CDFs. <clears throat> this problem also arises commonly in the world of stochastic optimization. We want to compute the maximum of some uh, objective function depending on a decision variable theta. We want to maximize this over a feasible set of decision parameters, lambda. And uh, when you look at the large n asymptotics of this maximum, that can be quite a complicated object. And again, uh, this would be a setting in which um, variance estimation would be difficult. So for example, in this context, it might be that the optimizer sits on the interior of the space lambda, or it could be that the optimizer is on the boundary and you get different central limit effects depending on where the optimizer is sitting. All right, so variance estimation is unpleasant. So what's an alternative to that? I'm going to talk, first of all, about what you would do in the non-sequential setting. So the standard method that's used in the non-sequential setting is the method of replication. So assume now that we have an estimator for which this is true, but we don't want to actually have to consistently estimate the variance parameter eta. So now what we can do is we'll just run this algorithm on m independent processes, and we'll use different streams of random numbers, independent random numbers on each of the different processes. So when you run this algorithm on m different processes, you'll get m different results from the uh, outputs of the different processes. And now we can make a grand average across the m processes, and we get the sample mean across the m processes. We get the sample variance across the m processes. So now we're averaging not in n, but over m, and we're computing variances not across n, but over m. And now, uh, because of the fact that all these alpha n i's are asymptotically normal as a consequence of satisfying this approximation, alpha bar n is basically the average of a whole bunch of approximately normal random variables. I'm computing down here something that looks like uh, a sample variance for a whole bunch of things that are approximately normal. We know that sample variances of exactly normal random variables follow a chi-square distribution. So this thing should follow approximately a chi-square distribution when the sample size n on each uh, uh, processor is large enough. So as a consequence, <clears throat> we get a limit theorem for this grand average and for this sample variance estimator in which we end up with a uh, student t random variable hitting, sitting over on the right-hand side. And the beauty, of course, of this result is that there's no nuisance parameter sitting on the right-hand side. There is no sigma on the right-hand side. That's been taken care of because we've divided through here by the sample variance. So it's been canceled out, so to speak, by the sample variance. So now we just calibrate our confidence intervals not using normal uh, limits, but using student t limits. And if we do that, we get a, another uh, sequence, another confidence interval procedure that has the desired coverage as n goes to infinity for a fixed number of processors m. So this is a method of replication I've just discussed. We've now seen that you can avoid <coughs> doing uh, a, uh, any variance estimation if we apply this method of replication. And it's ideal, obviously, for parallel implementation, but of course, and one of the things that's nice about parallel implementations is that uh, you have a so-called linear speed up when you apply these types of algorithms in the parallel context. Linear speed up just means that the algorithm runs m times faster when you have m processes. So Monte Carlo often has that linear speed up characteristic that's the best that you can typically get in a multiprocessor context. So you're getting that with a uh, with Monte Carlo. 
So now you can ask the question, so does this method of replication extend in an obvious way to sequential setting? So what about if we apply exactly the same idea as Chow and Robbins to this type of algorithm? So we just run this uh, fixed sample size algorithm until we get down to a precision epsilon, until the confidence interval shrinks down to a half width less than or equal to epsilon. Is it the case that you get asymptotically correct coverage with this class of algorithms? if you follow that simple-minded approach? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. You don't get the correct coverage when you apply this uh, particular variant. And the fundamental reason is that uh, <clears throat> in the context of algorithms where you consistently estimate the variance, and you look at how long you're in the algorithm for, well, you're in the algorithm basically for sigma squared z squared over epsilon squared time units. Remember, the actual algorithm puts n of epsilon equal to the sample variance times z squared over epsilon squared. Of course, the sample variance is basically sigma squared when you're consistently estimating. So this is the asymptotic uh, approximation to n of epsilon when epsilon is small. And uh, so <clears throat> fundamentally, this n of epsilon looks asymptotically deterministic as epsilon goes to zero in algorithms where you consistently estimate variance. The problem is when you use this method of replication, you're not consistently estimating the variance. You're basically canceling out the sigma squared. So you never actually estimate it per se. And in this context, the n of epsilon doesn't look asymptotically deterministic. It basically looks like a, it basically is random no matter how small you make epsilon. So n of epsilon looks asymptotically like w divided by epsilon squared, where w is a non-degenerate random variable. And what that basically means is that when you stop the algorithm, when you stop the algorithm at time n of epsilon, the error, well, you're gonna, here, here's the point estimate alpha bar n of epsilon, here's what you're trying to estimate alpha, and the error, roughly speaking, looks like sigma times, now I'm gonna be using a Brownian motion in here, so Brownian motion is describing the uh, time-dependent behavior of the averaging process that we're using in Monte Carlo. And so you're looking at the Brownian motion stochastic process stopped at time n of epsilon. But again, now this n of epsilon isn't looking asymptotically deterministic, it's looking random. And now somehow the distribution of alpha bar of n of epsilon at this time epsilon depends on the joint distribution of epsilon, n of epsilon and the Brownian motion v. So somehow, if you want to build good algorithms in this context, good sequential algorithms in this context, you need to somehow deal with the fact that you're going to have to uh, implicitly compute the joint distribution between the stopping time of m as epsilon and the Brownian noise b that's describing the dynamic error in the Monte Carlo process itself. All right. So we've already seen on this previous slide that somehow we're being led into having to think about Brownian motion as an approximation for our Monte Carlo process. And the reason is that in the sequential context, we are thinking about the dynamics of the estimation process. And so we were thinking about dynamics. We need to be thinking about approximated by Brownian motion because Brownian motion is describing the time-dependent behavior of the estimation process. So <clears throat> there are lots of ways of uh, characterizing the sense in which a uh, estimator or a sum of random variables are effectively the same uh, thing in many Monte Carlo contexts uh, can be approximated by Brownian motion. But the, the nicest one for our purposes is something called a strong approximation principle, which says that you can find a probability space supporting both the estimation process alpha of t being used in your Monte Carlo and a Brownian motion process, where you can write the estimator alpha of t as alpha plus sigma times the Brownian motion at time t divided by t. So the fact that we have b of t divided by t here is basically uh, representing the fact that in most Monte Carlo algorithms, we are averaging things. When you average things, basically, you're going to be looking at approximations that involve Brownian motion divided by t, not Brownian motion itself. And then there's going to be some error term, and the error term is going to be small relative to 1 over square root of t. So the thing that's nice about this type of strong approximation as opposed to uh, standard weak convergence formulations uh, of the sense in which a uh, Brownian motion process can approximate an estimation process, 
is that in a standard weak convergence result, basically that's describing the estimator process at one particular scale. So in this particular context, the natural scale in which to look at a Monte Carlo process as a function of, let's say, the parameter epsilon, is we're looking at time scales of order one over epsilon squared, one over epsilon squared because of the fact that square root convergence rate means that the amount of time required to get epsilon precision is going to be scaling at one over epsilon squared rate. But because of the fact that in these algorithms we also need to think about early termination characteristics, things that can happen at the very beginning of the simulation, we also want to be thinking about shorter time scales than one over epsilon squared. And this type of approximation gives us an approximation to the estimator process at multiple scales, not just one over epsilon squared, but over much wider range of scales. So it's very convenient for looking at estimator processes for that particular reason. All right, so <clears throat> that strong approximation implies that if you run M independent replications of this estimation process, we can now approximate the average across the M parallel processors as being the quantity that you're trying to compute plus a Brownian error. So the Brownian error here is basically being obtained by uh, averaging the Brownian motions that go with each of the individual processes alpha 1 through alpha m. So B bar m of t is the average of those m Brownian motions. The sample variance process, or the sample standard deviation process, takes the form sigma 1 over square root of m minus 1 times rm of t divided by t. When you apply the strong approximation principle where rm of t is expressed in terms of this uh, uh, Brownian quantity. Now here's some key facts. So b bar m, that's a, basically an average of Brownian motions. That's a Brownian motion process. rm is this uh, basic process is basically approximating the time dynamics of the sample standard deviation. These two processes are asymptotically, uh, so these two processes in the Brownian world are actually independent stochastic processes. So that uh, is uh, maybe not totally surprising if you remember the fact that in the sort of standard statistics world, the reason that uh, if you, when you take a, a normal sample from a population, the sample variance is known to be independent of the sample mean. So this is a dynamical version of this, of process level version of this. And it's true for the same basic reason as the fact that the uh, sample variance is independent of the sample mean in a normal case. What's the simplest proof of this? The simplest proof is if you look at the way that Rm is built up, it's built up from Bi of t minus B of Rm of t. And if you look at this set of Gaussian processes, this set of Gaussian processes is independent of B bar M. And the way that you show that is just by computing the covariance between them. The covariances are all zero. So uh, you have this very, very nice extension to the world of processes that the uh, Brownian process describing the sample, the estimator, is independent of the stochastic process that's describing the sample standard deviation as a function of time. And of course, this B bar M process, it has a variance uh, that is proportional to one over M, M being the number of processes because it's averaging over M processes. So we have to square, we have to take B bar M and multiply by root M to get a standard Brownian motion. And the RM process, this process down here, turns out to be equivalent in distribution to a Bessel process. Now, if you go back to the world of statistics, when you compute the sample variance, the sample variance is basically a chi-square with M minus one degrees of freedom. And the analog in this context is that this process Rm is a Bessel process of order of, uh, m minus 1, of dimension m minus 1. Now, what is a Bessel process? A Bessel process is the radial process that goes with Brownian motion in d dimensions. If you just look at the radial distance of that Brownian motion from the origin, that is a Bessel process starting from the origin. So it's describing Brownian motion, it's describing the distance of Brownian motion from the origin for a d-dimensional Brownian motion. So 
Now, uh, he went to Chris Rothreo's talk, he talked about transients of random walk in, one, uh, in three or more dimensions and recurrence in one or two dimensions. So that obviously is something you're going to see also for these Bessel processes. Bessel process is going to be a recurrent process in dimensions one and two. It's going to be transient in dimensions three or higher. Okay, so that'll play a role in a moment. So now we define uh, kappa m of epsilon r. This is going to be the stopping time for our sequential procedure. We continue running it, running the procedure, until we get the half width of the interval to be smaller than epsilon. Now, it's going to turn out that the, it's going to be useful to introduce a parameter r into the procedure. You'll see in a couple of slides why that's the case. So we'll think about, we run the procedure until sm of t over root m is smaller than epsilon divided by r. Now, one of the very nice, another very nice characteristic of Brownian motion is this uh, time inversion property. Namely that if you take uh, <clears throat> a Brownian motion and you run it in time scale 1 over t and multiply by t, this is another standard Brownian motion in distribution. And again, the easiest way to show that is, well, these are two Gaussian processes and just check that the mean and covariance structure match that of standard Brownian motion. So it's a very important property of Brownian motion. It turns out that with this property, you can show that uh, this scaled random variable goes to a chi-square with m minus 3 degrees of freedom. Now, where is that coming from? It's coming from the fact that this process, sm of t over root m, can be expressed in terms of the process rm of t. rm of t can in turn be expressed in terms of a Bessel process of dimension m minus 1. And uh, now, <clears throat> Basically, when we look at this, we're looking at a Bessel process uh, at, uh, maybe a bit more clear here. We're looking at a Bessel process divided by t and looking to see when that's smaller than epsilon. So this basically reduces the calculation to something involving a Bessel process. And now uh, the sort of key thing that happens is when you apply this time involution property of Brownian motion, namely the fact that t times b of 1 over t has the same distribution as standard Brownian motion. If you just apply this fact, what's going to turn out to be the case is that uh, when you look at the Brownian version of this random time, that's going to be the same uh, asymptotically as the uh, supremum, as 1 over the supremum of the set of t's such that a Bessel process in dimension m minus 1 of t is uh, less than or equal to 1. So we've now been reduced. So this kappa m of epsilon r, when you do the calculation in the Brownian approximation and you apply this time involution property, it turns out that this kappa m of r basically is described by this random variable. Now, if you think about what happens when m minus 1 is 1 or 2, m minus 1 is 1 or 2, you've got a recurrent Bessel process. That means it comes back to the origin infinitely many times, or a neighborhood of the origin infinitely many times. That means the supreme is going to be equal to infinity. That means this ratio is going to be 0. Now, that's relating to the fact that if you apply the algorithm that I've suggested here, in that context, this algorithm terminates early. In the Brownian time scale, it's basically terminating at time zero. Brownian time scale, when you think about it in terms of the original estimation process, is looking at time scales of order one over epsilon squared. So if you apply this with m equals one or m equals, with m minus one equal to one or m minus one equal to two, in other words, m equal to two or three, you end up with an algorithm that terminates at time little o of one over epsilon squared. So time smaller than one over epsilon squared. Well, you know that in the Monte Carlo world, you're just stopping at the wrong time in order to get precision epsilon. You can't use this algorithm for m equals 2 or 3 as a consequence. But when m is greater than or equal to 4, <clears throat> then we're looking at a Bessel process in dimensions 3 or higher. Bessel process in dimensions 3 or higher is a transient process. 
That means the last time that the process was within distance one of the origin is a finite valued random variable. And so this thing is in fact a well-defined positive quantity that's describing the actual asymptotic behavior of this stopping value as epsilon goes to zero. So that's a good thing. Now the question is, can this be computed? And yes, it can be computed. This distribution of this random variable can be computed. That's something that you can find in reviews and your, for example, on their book on excursion theory for Brownian motion related processes. And when you apply that in this context, it turns out that the limit random variable that appears here is a chi-squared random variable. Okay, that's great. Because now, when you go back and you think about stopping this estimation process at time kappa m of epsilon r, so this is the stopping time for the, the termination time for the sequential process for the actual estimator itself, and go into the Brownian world. In the Brownian world, you're looking at the Brownian motion stopped at this chi-square random variable. Where's the chi-squared random variable coming from? Chi-squared random variable is coming from uh, this SM of T process, which in turn is uh, basically in the Brownian world is being approximated by that RM of T process. RM of T is independent of the Brownian motion. That was one of the things we discussed earlier, which means the chi-squared will be independent of the Brownian motion, which means that when you go over here, we now have this random variable being independent of the Brownian motion itself, which means that when we condition on this, we can basically apply all the standard scaling rules for Brownian motion. And when you do that, you're basically looking at a Brownian motion divided by the square root of this chi-squared after you apply the Brownian scalings, Brownian similarity uh, properties, self-similarity properties. And we see that we have a Brownian motion or normal random variable divided by square root of a chi-squared, which gives us a student t. But we don't have quite a student t. We have the square root of m minus 1 over m minus 3. That has to be absorbed somehow. That's absorbed in the parameter r that I was mentioning earlier. So now if you just plug in this R, this analysis tells us that if we uh, run this sequential algorithm, we indeed will get the correct coverages as epsilon goes to zero. So we now have a solution to our sequential uh, stopping process. We actually have a good algorithm at this point for stopping a Monte Carlo calculation in which we don't actually need to explicitly estimate variances. We can just use this cancellation idea to get to avoid entirely the notion of having to estimate variances whatsoever in, a, uh, in um, utilizing this class of sequential procedures. So it's a nice, uh, <clears throat> it's I think an important development within the world of Monte Carlo because again, it's aligned with the way people do calculations in Monte Carlo. People almost always are doing calculations sequentially. You want to have good confidence intervals in that context and there are many, many Monte Carlo settings in which you don't want to have to estimate variances explicitly. Now we have an algorithm for taking care of that. All right, so this is easily implemented in the parallel setting. It can also be easily implemented in the standard sequential computing context. Uh, again, we have to have the number of processors being greater than or equal to four in order for this process to be asymptotically valid. And as I was mentioning earlier, if m is less than or equal to three, you have early termination uh, for this class of procedures. So what I've done this morning is I've given you uh, some uh, sense of where I think stochastic modeling within the operations research community has been going the last 20, 25 years and where it may be going in the next years to come. I've surveyed error assessment and some of the qu critical questions that arise in the world of output analysis within the uh, simulation context, within the Monte Carlo context. And what we've utilized today are some sort of basic tools from the world of stochastic processes, approximations of estimation processes by Brownian motion that allow us to develop and derive a new sequential procedure for use in Monte Carlo experimentation. I should say that uh, most uh, Monte Carlo algorithms involve uh, estimators that effectively are averages of one kind or another. When you have uh, algorithms in which the uh, estimator asymptotically looks like an average, uh, 
And you'd expect that the strong approximation principle that I discussed this morning uh, is going to be valid. But there are some Monte Carlo settings in which the estimation process does not, uh, is not, uh, cannot be approximated through this strong approximation uh, assumption that I made. In other words, and the reason is that there are some estimation processes that are studied and are utilized within the world of uh, Monte Carlo in which the algorithm itself, the estimator itself, does not asymptotically look like an X bar, like a sample average. And one of the instances in which that occurs is the world of stochastic approximation. So when you do stochastic gradient descent, or you apply kiefer wolfowitz style algorithms, Robbins-Monroe algorithms, and you think about the way those uh, estimation algorithms look as a function of time, what their dynamics look like as a function of time, uh, those algorithms are not described by B of T divided by T. They're described by a different type of Brownian, a different type of object. And so you would have to, if you want to build a sequential algorithm for Kiefer Wolfowitz, Robbins Monroe, stochastic approximation, you need to take the ideas that I've discussed here and somehow port them over to the uh, approximating uh, random process that arises for those types of estimators. So there are a number of other estimation settings in which uh, what I've discussed here today would not uh, directly apply. And so that's an area of future research for uh, those of you out in the audience. And uh, so with that, I will close my lecture. Thank you.